Uh, Sabina is a chartered psychologist, a neuroscientist, and the author of the international bestseller, 100 Days to a Younger Brain. Sabina, welcome to the session. Thank you very much for having me. Well, I prepared the most wonderful slides that had me in them and everything, but when you know it, Prezi has gone down. So I'm just going to speak. You're stuck with my face for the for the whole um the whole talk, but here goes. Um look you hold inside your head the most complex structure in the known universe and i would hazard a guess that you are not maximizing its potential i reckon that the most under used resource on the planet is the human brain and i am on a mission to help you to unleash that superpower so i'm going to just give you a few a few tips that are particularly relevant during COVID. I'm also going to talk very briefly about a couple of really cool things about the human brain. Um, and then I'm going to end with my um, favorite tip of all. So um, first of all though, I want to talk to you about your dental health. I would hazard a guess that most of you have a daily dental health habit. You've probably had it since you were about three years of age and you brush your teeth every morning and you brush them again in the evening time. Um, and I would also hazard a guess that very few of you have a daily brain health habit. Now, how crazy is that? I mean, don't get me wrong, dental health is super important because you need your teeth to eat, to speak and to smile, all things that are really important for your mental health and your brain health, but you need your brain for everything. There isn't one thing that you can do without your brain. So brain health matters. Now, your brain is constantly changing and it's your behaviors. And remember, thinking is a behavior, your experiences and your lifestyle that shape your brain. What you do, and actually just as importantly, what you don't do influences how resilient your brain can be in the face of challenge. And challenge takes many forms. It can be the stress we're experiencing now. It can also be aging or injury or disease, including diseases like COVID-19. Now, um, I like to think of adopting a brain healthy lifestyle as investing in brain capital that not only optimizes your brain performance in the here and now, but also allows you to build reserves that you can cash in at some point in the future to cope with or compensate for challenge, including diseases uh, like dementia. Now, um, just for a minute, before I tell you something else really cool about the brain, would like you to think about the human brain. And I, I'm pretty sure when you think about the human brain, you will think about that horrible, crinkly, bleh, stodgy mass that you're used to seeing. And the brain only looks like that because it has been preserved in formaldehyde. Um, your brain actually is the most thriving, exciting, living organ. It's got 86 billion brain cells. I had some beautiful images to show you. Just Google brainbow and you will find amazing images of your 86 billion brain cells, each of those, there, there's trillions of connections. And just as you're sitting here, they are communicating with each other and with the rest of your body using electrical and chemical signals. So that's the way you need to think about your brain as this really, really exciting, powerful organ. Now your brain also has what we call neuroplasticity. It and that's just kind of a fancy word for saying that it's adaptable, it's flexible, it can change. It has the capacity to reroute neur neurons and, and recon reconfigure and even grow new connections. And the more brain connections you have, actually the better uh, for your brain health. Now your brain is also resilient. And we know this from a repeated observation by multiple clinicians that, um, some people are more resilient to brain injury or brain disease than others. So for example, two individuals could sustain a stroke of the same magnitude and one of them, and in the same part of their brain, and one 
one of them can have severe impairment and you know require rehabilitation and the other has minimal impairment now that's because that we say that individual is resilient we call that resilience reserve that's the area of research that i work in and the thing is, over many years, we've discovered that this, res this reserve is linked to certain lifestyle factors, certain activities, and um, even to certain attitudes. So um, I have a whole grid, I'm happy to share it on social media or whatever afterwards. Um, but I just thought I would focus on three of those that are particularly relevant to um, us living through this really really strange times of pandemic lockdown and uh, social distancing and one of those is to stay socially connected and um, people with more social ties live longer uh, they um, are less depressed they have better cognitive function um, than people with less social ties now what we would say about social isolation is that it is as detrimental to your health as obesity or smoking uh, and there's lots of different ways in which that occurs one of the ways that happens is that when we're socially isolated as a lot of us learned during first lockdown we can engage in unhealthy behaviors we can drink alcohol to excess to cope we don't have a support group beside help us to help us stay on the straight and narrow um, and we maybe lack the motivation to kind of eat healthily um, because we're not going out and socializing uh, with people. But also um, there's another factor um, that another way in which social isolation impacts on our mental health as well as our brain health. And you, you have to understand that we are social creatures. And humans don't do well in isolation. We have survived and evolved as a species because we're part of a social group. So your brain, if you are isolated and lonely, uh, your brain goes into this high alert mode, this self-preservation mode. Your amygdala, which is a part of your brain that's involved in the fear response, really becomes ramp ramped up. You start to see threats where there's none. You also will have terrible difficulty getting into deep, helpful sleep because you're on alert. Also, if you become chronically uh, lonely, uh, what will happen is you will lose your capacity for empathy and you will also lose some of your social skills. Now, often when people look at somebody who's been socially isolated or whatever, they might say, no wonder they're on their own, they're really odd. Now, the, what the research would show is people who have poor social skills don't end up lonely. What it is, is when we become lonely and socially isolated, we lose our social skills. So yes, we do become a bit odd because we're in this protective mode. Now, if you've ever felt lonely, it just means that you're human. Loneliness is what we call an aversive signal. So hunger is also an aversive signal. By that, it just means it's really unpleasant and you will be motivated to take an action to make that signal go away. So if you're hungry, you're motivated to eat so that the hunger will go away. Loneliness is the exact same. It is an aversive signal to get you to act to get connected. Unfortunately, we fail to act on that and we end up becoming lonely and isolated. And unfortunately, at the moment, we're kind of forced into a situation. So what I would say to employers, employees, teams, is that actually we have to make a very special effort. Modern society encourages isolation and loneliness. We measure success by how big a box we can isolate ourselves in. But now, even more than ever, we need to proactively take steps. So people are working remotely. So um, I know people are using remote technology for meetings and etc but you need to use them for social engagement and give your teams permission to do so you need to replace those water cooler moments you know when you're in work and you walk along the corridor and you bump into someone at the copier or the the kitchen so introduce those i think we need to look out for each other also uh, check in with the, if people listen to what people are really saying and if you do feel lonely or are struggling, ask for help. But remember, it's harder to ask for help than it is to offer help. And if someone says no the first time, don't take that as a final no. Keep on asking if you feel that they're uh, struggling. 
Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the importance of managing stress. Um, stress, uh, we're all experiencing stress. Stress in and of itself is not a bad thing. Uh, you need stress to rise to the challenges of life, you know, to, to create neuroplasticity in your brain even. But when stress becomes problematic is when it's poorly managed and it becomes chronic. And it actually changes the structure and the functioning of your brain. Um, and particularly in the area of areas of your brain involved in learning and memory. It also dampens down neuroplasticity in your frontal lobes and ramps it up in your amygdala. So normally when you have a stressor, a threat, an acute stressor, the information comes in and goes rapidly via a short route to your amygdala so you can jump out of the way or turn and face that threat. And then there's a slower route where it comes to your frontal lobes, the thinking part of your brain, and that can assess the whole situation and decide whether you need to be stressed or not. It can bring that rational thought to it. Unfortunately, when you become chronically stressed, this part of your brain starts to shrink and your amygdala uh, starts to increase in size and override this part in a sense. And you move from slow reflective acting to reflexive acting, um, which really is um, not good for your brain. So um, there's lots of ways that you can um, manage stress. I want to point out as well that stress is very individual. It also doesn't matter whether a stressor is real or not. Psychological stress imagined or otherwise imagining a terrible future will release the stress, stress response just the same as, you know, being confronted by a mugger down a dark laneway will. Um, Everybody's stress response is different. The key is finding your own stress sweet spot where you're challenged enough to have meaning in life, uh, where it's not, you, you don't have too much, where you feel you can't cope. Um, but also too little stress is really, really bad for your brain. And we all don't hear enough about that. Too little stress leads to boredom. And also your brain uses so much it uses 25% of all the oxygen and nutrients circulating in your body at any time. So it can't afford to waste resources on something that's not being used. So you will actually lose brain cells, your brain will atrophy, and it also can lead to depression. Um, so one of my favorite tips for managing stress is um, to smile. <laughs> Um, and you might think that that's very funny, but it's particularly important during lockdown when we are socially isolated. We tend to think of smiling as a reactive response, either to another person or to something really, really nice happening. And so a lot of us aren't smiling at home. But the fact of the matter is smiling actually boosts the, the, the birth of brain cells. It encourages neuroplasticity. It actually boosts your immune function. It lowers your blood pressure. Laughter, if you take it to the next level, actually eliminates cortisol from your system. It is nature's natural stress buster, which is often why I think we laugh during times of tragedy i mean i've never i've attended funerals where i've never had greater laughter in my life so i would subscribe i no, not subscribe i would prescribe smiling five times a day once first thing in the morning let it be the very first thing that you do before you can have any negative thoughts just smile uh, once last thing at night it's a fabulous way to end the day i would suggest that you share at least one smile with someone else because that will force you to get socially connected and you can do whatever you want with your other two smiles um, thank you very much